Thank you. It's going to be exhausting sitting and listening to talks all day. So let's get some oxygen into our brains first. Let's get our brains started with an exercise and a little thought experiment. So when I count to three, let's all together take a very deep breath. One, two, three. All right. Now, I want you to look around. Look around. Imagine everybody in this room would form a human chain, right? You hold each other's hands and form a human chain. It would be about 200 meters long. Now, imagine this was not a regular chain, but a chain of ancestors. So the first person is himself, the second person is one of his parents, the third person is one of his grandparents, and so on. We go back in time as we follow this chain to the end. If the first person is alive today, the person at the very end of this chain, the one standing only 200 meters apart, would be from a time where society changed, from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. This is how far in time we would go back in only 200 meters. Now, imagine all the inhabitants of Germany would form a chain like that. How far in time could we go back then? Now, unfortunately, this experiment wouldn't work. The chain would rip apart. You couldn't hold hands with the person at the end of this chain because it's very, very hard to hold hands with a fish. <laughs> Seeing evolutionary timescales in this context helps us realize that it was not too long ago that we shared common ancestors with all the different creatures on Earth today. That's why scientists who work on microscopic worms, fungi, or insects are mostly not interested in these organisms themselves, but try to derive general knowledge that might also apply to human. One of these scientists was the famous zoologist Conrad Lorenz, and he discovered an interesting phenomenon in the species of birds that he was working with. When he took an egg out of their nest and placed it somewhere different, the birds would perform a typical movement with their beak to roll it back into the nest. Now, once the bird has initiated this movement, Lawrence could take the egg away, yet the bird would still continue this movement in the air, acting like it's rolling an egg back, although it was gone. So how does this apply to human? Well, it appears that the birds know exactly what they have to do, but they actually don't know why they're doing it. And when I think back, I remember that this is exactly how I felt sometimes during my studies. You know, I'm a molecular biologist, and I remember choosing this profession because I wanted to change something. I wanted to help moving medical research forward in order for people to receive better therapies. This is what I wanted to do. Yet some years into my studies, I found myself working on projects that I really enjoyed doing, but I didn't see how anyone could ever benefit from that. At some point, <clears throat> I was working on a microscopic worm called C. elegans. It's so small, you can hardly see it with the naked eye. And I've been working on its embryos. You know, I've been trying to figure out how the fertilized egg decides where to develop the head and where to develop the tail, which, in case of a worm, look pretty much the same. So I didn't see how anyone could ever benefit from what I was doing. That's why I moved on to another project involving animals that are much more similar to human. And of course, the first one that comes into mind is the fruit fly. Whoa. Did you know that 60% of the fly's genetic information, its DNA, is identical to the human one? 60%! Now, unfortunately, that's not enough for us to fly home tonight. Uh, to put that in context, maybe I should mention that we're also sharing 50% of our genetic information with the banana. <laughs> Although, some people seem to be more closely related to fruits than others. Also, 50% identical DNA does not mean that you can create a human out of two bananas. That's a common misconception. <laughs> Nevertheless, a remarkable similarity, and many things we know about biology and disease today, we know from flies. Now, what you see on the left is the brain of a healthy fruit fly. What's shown here in green are stem cells. What you see on the right is the brain of a fruit fly that has a mutation in a gene that is leading to the development of a brain tumor. The stem cells overproliferate, and everything you see in green here are tumor cells. Does anyone maybe know the name of the gene that leads to the brain tumor formation when it's mutated? It's called brain tumor. Creative guys, these biologists. Now, interestingly, the exact same mutation 
is often responsible for brain tumor development in humans. So our idea was to find a cure in flies that might be translatable to patients. So this time, I felt on the, on the right track towards my initial goal of helping people. But wait a second. Why is this tumor green? Have you ever seen a green tumor? In the 1960s, the Japanese biochemist Osamu Shimomura became obsessed with a kind of jellyfish that is as beautiful as its name, Equoria victoria. It got an interesting property. If you put it under blue light, it shines green light back, a phenomenon called fluorescence. Shimomura tried to find out how that works, so he dedicated his scientific career towards studying these animals. And he needed a lot of them. He paid local children one penny for each jellyfish they brought to him. And after some years, he finally managed to analyze and extract the source of this green fluorescent, and it turned out to be a protein. Does anyone maybe know the name of the protein, which is green fluorescent? Green fluorescent protein. You got the pattern. <laughs> now, this protein is encoded by a gene. Today, we can take this genetic sequence and add it to other genes. The proteins that then derive from these genes are labeled with green fluor fluorescence. And this allows us to visualize and track different proteins within single cells under a microscope. And this is a huge deal. It revolutionized molecular biology. Everyone in biomedical research today is at some point using the green fluorescent protein, and Shimomura got a Nobel Prize for it. And as I've shown, it also enabled the cancer research that I was doing. When Shimomura started to work on jellyfish, he was driven only by his curiosity. Now let me ask you, do you think he was aiming at revolutionizing molecular biology when he was examining jellyfish? No. When they first reported about the green fluorescent protein, it had no particular importance. There was no apparent practical application. Shimomura knew what he was doing and how to do it, but he didn't really know why he was doing it. There was no obvious goal waiting at the end, except for satisfying his curiosity. You see what I want to tell you, but it might be hard to relate to this kind of research if you have another background. So let's, dis let's discuss this maybe in another context that we're more familiar with. Um, I forgot my mobile phone. Hey, can I borrow yours? Sweet. Put it on selfie mode. <laughs> Sorry for that. It's like, ah, uh, say cheese. Right now, thank you. The first live on stage TEDx selfie in history is flying through the air into the Facebook of my friends, or in this case of your friends. <laughs> now, if I did that two generations ago, they would have resurrected the witch burning laws. So why can we do such things? In the 1800s, the physicist Heinrich Hertz became the first to verify the existence of electromagnetic waves, nowadays known as radio waves. In an interview, he was asked whether it will ever be possible to transmit messages with his discovery, and he said no. The oscillations are too slow and the devices are too small. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Hertz died six years after his discovery, thinking that he found an interesting piece of physics with no application whatsoever. Yet only two years after his death, a message was transmitted over a distance of a few hundred meters using radio waves. The message consisted of only two words, Heinrich Hertz. Heartbreaking. <laughs> Hertz never thought about enabling communication, but when, when, when he was researching electromagnetic waves, he enabled the radio, the television, there would be no, no mobile phones, and there would be no sending selfies into Facebook. Although we might be better off without that one. But, of course, it's not really a picture that you're sending. It's a binary code consisting of zeros and ones that is encoding a picture. Now, who came up with this code? It was not some dude who wanted to build an electronic device, but it was a philosopher named Gottfried Leibniz in the 16th century. He designed the language of modern computers because he thought that binary was symbolic for the Christian idea of creating something out of nothing. Try to get funding for that nowadays. 
there was no application, right? He came up with the language of modern computers without thinking about any application. Uh, he also was driven only by his curiosity. He was not a scientist, but he followed his drive and came up with the fundament of every cat video you're watching on YouTube today. But, of course, that's all useless if your smartphone runs out of battery. So we got to get some energy into that. How is this energy generated? In the 18th century, the former bookbinder Michael Faraday um, made his way into the Royal Institution of Great Britain. And he became very well known for the amazing Christmas lectures that he, that he was giving, uh, which, by the way, are given until today to inspire the public. One of his most famous experiments uh, included two connected coils of wire on the opposite sides of a table. Now, in one of the coils, there was a magnetic needle, a compass needle. When Faraday moved a magnet through the coil on the other side of the table, without touching anything, the compass needle started to spin. With this humble experiment, Faraday demonstrated one of his discoveries, electromagnetic induction. The basis of the electric motor and the electricity generating step in most kinds of power plants, like coal, gas, water, wind, atomic energy, you name it. They all produce electricity by moving a magnet relative to a coil. Now, did Faraday foresee that? There is a legend by which once an old lady came up to him after one of his Christmas lectures. She saw the induction experiment and she asked the question that many scientists fear most. She said, my dear, of what use is it? Faraday kept it cool and said, lady, of what use is a baby? I mean, I know we all love our children, but let's be honest. Babies are not very helpful. They're leaky, they got sticky fingers, they constantly pick their nose, it's gross. But you never know what a baby could develop into. It could become a great artist, a great scientist, or simply a great human being. And it's the same with ideas, it's the same with research. You cannot predict what it might be good for one day. In the case of Faraday, it became the foundation of society, because everything you see here today is in some form depending on electricity. Yet when we think about how progress is made, we often think it works something like this. You got a great idea, you test it, and you develop something awesome. But usually, this is not how great leaps are accomplished, because any of you, you're just confirming what you thought in the first place. This is how big steps are made. You start following up a random interest, get lost and end up somewhere nobody ever thought about going to before. And maybe it's just me, but the part where you have no idea what's going on, that's the biggest part. And that's where big discoveries are made. Of course, it's not always a Nobel Prize, right? Many times it looks like a dead end. But we've got to understand that knowledge itself has a value. Charles Darwin never aimed at revolutionizing our worldview. Yet, when he was working on birds, he accidentally revealed that we all evolved from a common origin. This knowledge is one of the most beautiful gifts that biology gave to us. You are a cousin of every monkey, every bird, every fish, every plant, even every gut bacterium that you're sharing this planet with. And we all know people where the bacterium is even the most obvious ancestor. Besides its practical applications, this knowledge gives us a valuable feeling of connectedness to each other. Right now, there's little practical benefit from knowing about other galaxies and the accelerating expansion of the universe, but it's a great feeling to know your place in the cosmos. Knowledge is beautiful. It's a part of culture. If you read history books, you come to believe that modern society depends on conquerors and political leaders, when in fact it's based on people who had the guts of following their curiosity independent of the predicted usefulness. Because oftentimes it's them who find something radical in you. Remember the deep breath that we took at the beginning? There are more atoms of air in one breath than there are volumes of breaths in the Earth's atmosphere. That's why with each breath that you take, you inhale atoms that were previously exhaled by those accidental heroes of science that I've been talking about. 
I'm convinced that most of what there is to know has still to be discovered. And maybe you, they will stumble upon something that later turns out unexpectedly useful. So whatever it is that excites you, there is no need to waste your breath on something else than following your curiosity, because that in itself is shaping the future. Thank you.